All right, so just to recap real quick, we've talked about single agency. Single agency is where you represent one principal in the deal. Probably 90% of all the deals you work with. Now in the market in Indiana and probably throughout the United States right now, a lot of representation. So maybe it's not 90%, maybe it's now only 80 because there is a lot more representing of both sides of the party. Some states, Florida doesn't allow dual agency. So single agency is when you represent one side or the other. And I've said it once before, you're either the listing agent or the selling agent. Listing agent works with the sellers. Selling agent works with a buyer. That would be single agency. That is what we have been discussing up to now. It is possible that you end up under a dual agency where you represent both the buyer and the seller on the same deal. Very important you catch that last section. Write that down. You work with the buyer and the seller on the same deal. If I have a client that's buying and selling their house, that's not dual agency. I'm helping them as the listing agent on their property, and then we're gonna go, same client, go buy another house. That's not dual agency, dude. That's two single agencies going on. A dual agency, some states like Indiana call it limited. Some states call it intermediary agency. So it's just when you work with both the buyer and the seller on the same transaction, okay? Now, for that to actually be true in every state that allows it, it has to be a written, informed consent prior to actually doing any agency activities. That is very key as well, because there are a lot of people that I know that used to say, I have heard in the past, well, we had it and signed it when we wrote the offer. Well, actually, you, you need to get them to sign that before you show the house. Because while you're showing the house, you could slip up and make a mistake and cost the deal. All right. So you actually need this written informed consent prior to any activities that would require a license. So showing the house. I understand that it seems asinine, but... You know, you've listed the house, you put a sign in the yard, and after all, that's why we put a sign in the yard, isn't it? Is to get that buyer to come and go, dude, I saw your sign, I want to go see the house. You are supposed to go, okay, I'll be right there. You show up at the house and you go, dude, I know you just called me, and you know I got it listed because you used my friggin' sign to call me, but you understand I got this listed, and it's okay with you. And they would sign the form. And then you would say, okay, wait here in the driveway and I'm going to walk up to the seller and knock on the door and say, hey, seller, I've got a buyer standing right here. Is it okay if I bring the buyer in? And the seller says, sure. And they sign the form. Now you have written informed consent and permission by both parties prior to any activities. And now you say, okay, I'm going to show the house. Now understand one of the key points is that it can be denied by either party. It can be denied. The seller, the buyer may go, yeah, I know I called you and it's okay. And you go up to the seller and say, hey, I got a buyer, is it okay? And the seller says, no, I actually have had this happen in the commercial world before. I was dealing with a commercial investor client of mine and I dealt with him on about 20 different commercial properties and on the second one, I had one of my buyers call me and go, hey, man, I want to go see this. And Stan said, hey, I want to see the property. So I called John and I'm like, hey, John, can I show the property? I've got a buyer. And John said, no, you know too much about me. You know my financial position. You know my ownership position. You know the fact I have other properties. I would rather you not represent that buyer. Okay. Does that kind of suck? Yeah, for a couple different reasons. Obviously, the most notable one is the pay. <laughs> the second is now I got to take this client that is my buyer client that I've helped before and give them to another agent. 
And I did charge a referral fee for that. So I called a partner of mine in the Century 21 that I had owned and said, hey, look, Betsy, I need you to take stand, go see John's property. When he writes an offer, uh, and he's going to, I get a referral because I referred my buyer to you. You run the risk of potentially that buyer now dealing with another agent, and we just traditionally don't like that, okay? So <clears throat> limited agency or dual agency is when you represent both parties on the same deal. A lot of times you hear people call that a me, me deal. And in this market right now, it's probably a little more frequent than what I told you. In the old markets that I remember, 90% were single agency. Very seldom did you get a, a dual agency. Now there's a lot more of it going on because there are so many buyers that are looking to buy. They just call the sign. All right. They call that me, me deal. If you do it on a small me or a small house, <laughs> that's called a mini me. Yeah, I pretty much screwed that joke up. <laughs> now, if two agents in the same agency are representing a buyer and a seller, that is not limited agency. Let me go back and say that. Let's... For the example, I'm a managing broker and Jim, yeah, you, works for me and has the listing. And Holly, in the back of the room, who works for me, brings a buyer. That is called in-house agency. Some states call it designated agency. That is not dual agency that does not require disclosure. So that's kind of a small loophole. Now, there's a loophole inside of the loophole, okay? If one of those agents that are representing the buyer and the seller is in fact the managing broker, then it is limited agency. Let's go back and say that again. If Jim, working for me, has the listing and I bring the buyer myself, one of my buyers, that in fact is limited agency in most every state that allows it. Because I now know what I know and I can ask Jim and know what he knows, so I actually have an advantage actually have an advantage. So the loophole is in-house or designated is when I can separate the two agents and I can talk to Jim in my office and then I can talk to Holly in my office. That's okay. That does not require limited agency forms. If I, as a practicing managing broker and am actually working with clients, bring the client to that deal, even though there's Jim and I, that is still limited agency. That's a loophole you need to be aware of. That is another reason why most of you managing brokers should not be actually brokering. I know that's not a very popular point, especially if you work in a small brokerage that has one or two agents. You have to keep the lights on so you broker. There are a lot of reasons managing brokers should not be brokers, should not actual broker deals, all right? And we could go into that all day, and that's probably just my opinion, but I'm going to tell you this is one of the things that would be a problem if you actually did do this, all right? So make sure that when you're creating this dual agency, it is not accidental, Meaning, don't get excited, don't run and show that buyer the house, and then write the offer and then go, oh crap, I forgot to get the permission, I created actual, uh, um, I created accidental dual agency. Even though it was an accident, you still owe both people their obligations, okay? If it's not consensual, it could have it could be deemed by your commission 
the, the state real estate commission that your part could be forfeited. Your commission could be forfeited in that. All right. I wasn't very clear. I kind of stuttered through it because I was looking at the typo error up on the screen here behind me. If dual agency is not consensual, the realtor may have deemed to have forfeited his right to the commission. There have been lawsuits where that has happened. All right. So just understand that, that the seller could come back and go, dude, you weren't legally their agent as far as I'm concerned, because it was not disclosed and permission was not given. So there is this other concept that I want to talk about. And I'm going to tell you now that this next concept of transactional brokerage is actually one that is hotly debated back and forth many, many different ways in many different states, including my own state of Indiana. There is a lot of discussion with this. A transaction broker is one in essence, which they now have two customers and they owe no agency loyalty to either side of the party. So you are not an advocate. Now you still still have non uh, fiduciary responsibilities. You still have to treat both sides honest and fair, but you don't give help or advice to either side. You are essentially the Switzerland of real estate. You become neutral to both parties. You cannot help them. Now, where you used to see this happen a lot, and I'm telling you now, I've only done this about three or four times in my 20 year career. So it's not very common. Let's say a for sale by owner calls you up and goes, hey dude, I have already found a buyer. I don't need you to broker, which in essence is what we do, bring buyers and sellers together. They've already done that. But he looks at you and says, I don't understand the forms. Can you show me where to sign? And you look at it and you go, yes, sign here, sign there, sign there, sign there. And one of the clients or one of the customers says, oh, do you think I could have got a better deal? I can't help you. I can't create an agency with you because I am a transactional broker. I represent in essence, the deal. I'm neutral. If I give you advice, I have in fact created implied agency and now I owe you all of my fiduciary obligations, which means I would have to loyalty, disclosure, confidentiality, and I don't want any of that. All right. You can charge a fee for that. Typically, typically I'm going to tell you it's a flat fee, 500 bucks. Now here's the issue. Here's the issue. And here's what's going on in the state of Indiana. Because there is no agency involved, you as a unlicensed attorney cannot discuss legal contracts. So in essence, what Indiana is saying is this activity cannot happen because the second they bring a contract to you and go, where do I sign? You are not a practicing attorney, unless of course you are, and that's a whole different story, but you are not a practicing attorney. You cannot explain contracts to someone with whom you do not have agency with. The fact that you have agency through a traditional methodology that we have talked about as the listing agent, you now have the right to discuss the legal document called a listing agreement or a purchase agreement. If you have no agency with either one of them, which is what we're talking about, a transactional broker, you have no agency, therefore no client. You only have two customers. The Indiana Bar Association is saying, dude, you can't be involved in that because you can't read a contract. So that is typically what a lot of states now are saying. So I don't know as of the this class that we're having today, where Indiana would fall into this scenario because 
if something goes south and they go, okay, who explained the document and they suck you into a court case, there could potentially be a judge that go, you were practicing law without a degree, which not only is a violation of our code of ethics, it is also a violation of law. So don't think that you might skate out of getting caught by the NAR. You could still get caught by the state of Indiana attorney general or any state's attorney general as holding yourself as an attorney when you are not legally allowed to. So in essence, you're practicing without a license. Now, here's the upside. The upside is I've done three or four of these in 20 years. I would venture to say that 95% of you, if not all of you, have probably never done any of these. Because typically what a for sale by owner thinks about when they have found the buyer and they need help with a contract, who's the first person they would think of? Yeah, it's usually the attorney. And they call their attorney and go, hey dude, where do I sign this contract, yada, yada, yada. The other portion about this that I don't want to keep beating this dead horse is if you have no agency with either one of these, you cannot use your forms. Most states only allow the agent to use their forms if they have an agency relationship with the client. Well, as defined by what we're talking about, transactional broker, we have no agency with either one of them. We can't use our purchase agreement that an attorney has written. Got it? So you could also be in trouble there where your state agency comes after you and goes, dude, how did this for sale by owner and this buyer get your purchase agreement because you are not an agent or a relationship with either one of them? Now, if you are a single agent, like working for just a buyer and this for sale by owner who you don't have agency with, yeah, I have agency with my buyer. I can use my contracts. But if I have two customers in essence, i.e. a transactional broker, how did your form get sucked into this deal because there's no agency there? They should have had their own attorney write a purchase agreement, either the buyer's attorney or the seller's attorney, because there's no way that it got this form from the state association of realtors, whatever state you're in, because there's no agency. So I'm telling you, I probably would tell you now, and I have t told my agents within my agency, don't do this. The risk is not worth the, the reward. I mean, especially since you're charging hundred bucks, 500 bucks, even a thousand bucks. The risk of you getting sucked in or my brokerage getting sucked in to a lawsuit far outweighs that $500. So while we talk about this in a course, I am going to tell you this is probably not a good idea for you guys. Most states are having heartburn right now and most state bar associations love to go after realtors, all right? So it's just easier and simpler if I would tell you, hey, transactional brokerage, don't do it, all right? That would be my fatherly advice to all of you. Just don't do it, all right? Now, if you wanna do it, understand there are risks that you are taking, okay? Cool, so we've got single agency, one side or the other, and we've got this dual agency. Just make sure that the dual agency is an informed consent written by both parties prior to any activities that would require a license and they can say no. All right, cool.